The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. And it's so great to be bringing you the final lecture of the fourth movement of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, the March to the Gallows. So we started this movement with a wonderful downward sloping theme and some really great character writing, very cinematic or theatrical in a way. And then in the second lecture, we explored the massive march section with this beautiful triumphant theme, which, by the way, is not going to appear for the rest of this movement. But it's just that one middle part, which I made into the middle lecture. Now, the march to the gallows sort of seems to pick up momentum, though it doesn't necessarily speed up unless your conductor would get a little too excited about all this. Rather, we're going to see an increase of determination and purpose and intensity with some very imaginative scoring. This was sort of the tail end of a gesture that was wrapping things up in the previous lecture. A little bit of sighing here in the strings. Now we've got combined pizzicato strings and staccato winds working their way downwards to the next episode. And Let's just take a quick minute here to break that down. We've got the second violins on top, and they are doubling what's going on in the flutes and the first oboe. And then below that, we've got our altos, our violas on that F sharp going downwards. And we see those same pitches being doubled in the second oboe and the first clarinet. Then below that, there of course is the cello line right in here, and that is being doubled by the second clarinet and then an octave lower by the bassoons. So it's very economical. There really is no need for the double basses to be doubling this in here. You'll see that a lot of times in little places like this, Berlioz is careful not to make the weight too intense sometimes. He'll lighten things slightly so that the color of the instruments stands out rather than just giving everything all the time to make it as big as possible. Now from this point right in here the trombones and ophiclide, our lower brass, really come into their own. Now we will break down what they're doing here but first let's look at the window dressing around it. The pizzicato is coming to an end, so the first notes here in our middle strings, seconds, violas, and cellos, are going to be pizzicato notes. And then from that point on, the players just go immediately into this arco passage right in here. Whereas that is covered a little bit by the entrance of the double basses, this time on a very low G. Notice that most of the time Berlioz has been keeping the basses up. Here is an instance where he's allowing them to play their lowest possible note on that pitch. So G at the bottom of the staff. And the first violin's coming in very fiercely on this fortissimo. And that kind of covers the fact that the other strings are ending this little walk down here with pizzicato. Now, why didn't they just all start going to arco right here 
on the first beat. That is because Berlioz needs to finish this line here in the winds right on this note right here. And these notes are being doubled to a degree by the pizzicato in the strings. So the G is doubling the flute and the oboe. And this B flat in violas and cellos is being doubled by the clarinets. So this has got to wrap up right here and then the fun can begin. Now, when you listen to this, you might think that Berlioz is having the players play all down bows, but I have never seen an orchestra do that. If you watch the orchestra of the Franz Liszt University at Weimar, then you'll notice that they are going back and forth, and it's perfectly possible, but it does sound really direct, as if they were all playing down bows one after the other. It's just because of the force of the music and also because of the simplicity of the scoring. Doing these tetrachords here, it just fits right into the fingers and is also starting on the lower part of the instrument. This right here could be played on the third string or the fourth string even. But one way or another, fairly low on the violin. Now right here, this would have to be played on the fourth string. And the same thing is true for the cellos. So it is going to be savage. And the players may elect to sort of stay on lower strings and higher positions as they gradually walk up. Now notice here that the harmony is extremely simple. It is just walking up one step at a time from G to F sharp and then on the next page there will be another bar of F sharp. So an eight bar phrase covering a scale with a flat second step. So that would be a form of G Phrygian harmonic minor with this sharp seven. Now meanwhile, up above, following the same basic pattern here, if you look at the first notes of each of these figures in our upper winds, you'll see that it's the same notes, G, A flat, B flat, C, D, here E, with a changing of pattern right in here for the oboes so that they don't have to go too high, and then F sharp. Now this is such awesome scoring here. Not just this thrusting kind of scoring for our string section on their lower strings, but also this kind of demonic scoring. This is something that shows up uh, later on in other pieces by other composers. These sort of dancing triplets above, uh, something similar I think is in Night on the Bald Mountain. And of course here it's almost as if the artist is seeing the dancing flames of hell that he's going to be consigned to as a bit of a prelude. Maybe he's starting to hallucinate a little bit as he's drawn on the cart towards the place of execution, or maybe he's marching. It's not quite clear whether or not he is being marched there or being driven there in a cart, which would have been, I think, a little bit more customary. If you see different images, um, sketches that people made at the time of executions, where people were taken to the guillotine, usually you see that they were sort of rounded up and stuck in a cart. Not to get too gruesome here. <laughs> Let's stick to orchestration, not uh, decapitation. Notice how Berlioz is being careful here not to slur up from G to G in the C clarinets. I think he wants to sort of keep everything comfortable and spontaneous rather than setting any kind of possibly difficult technical challenge for the clarinetists of his time. That's my assessment of why he goes up from a B flat here, and possibly also just to keep the harmonic identity firm here of G minor by playing the mediant in at least one of the wind instruments. And then continuing on here, A flats, notice that the clarinets are doubling at the octave identically with the upper winds. And this continues on. And then here, we see the oboe compromise playing this note here and then catching the top of the pattern 
Berlioz does not have the player slur, but just play an ordinary note and then come in staccato here. And then continuing on doubling exactly at pitch with the clarinets. And then that continues with the middle winds an octave below the flutes. Okay, so finally, let's talk about that theme. Starting in the bassoons, and one thing I feel really lovely about here is how low Berlioz pushes those bassoons as thematic players. It's so awesome, and in fact, they are playing a four below any of the brass. So while that pitch could have easily been doubled by the second ophiclide, it is just being played by our quartet of bassoons in this fearsome unison. And you can hear some of that on the recording, the focus when that many bassoonists are playing at once on low pitches going all the way down to their lowest B flat. It just has a savageness that is probably not the equal of a fiercely played tuba, but still has an enormously compelling grunt to it. Now, do you recall that there was a passage before in the beginning of this symphony where the downward sloping theme was repeated up a third? Berlioz is going to develop that idea with these downward sloping themes jumping up a third again and again, and then jumping all the way up here a fifth from the previous D to A, which condenses some of the melodic motion and will be further condensed in subsequent bars. That is our rock bottom line right in here being played by the bassoons. Those same pitches are being doubled at the octave by the ophiclide and the third trombone. So here you see both of them, just focus on the third trombone here, in unison, walking down to this B flat, an octave above the bassoons. Then once again, they come in an octave above the bassoons, walking down to the D, same in both parts. Now here, we're getting a little higher than Berlioz comfortably wants to score for Ophiclide. So the third trombone just takes over on the higher D, and because of the growing tension for that player in the embouchure and in the projection, this line does not need to be doubled anymore. So it's fine for the Ophiclide to double the bassoon at this point and continue on. And then above that, we see the harmonization of this melody. The first and second trombones kind of filling this out into a sort of triadic harmony. So it becomes a chorale with this descending theme. And what I think is cool about it is that previously, the descending theme had lost energy every time, starting strong and then sort of slowly fading away as the hopes of the condemned man faded away with each growing step. Here though, we're seeing an increase of strength and that makes sense because of pushing these trombones higher and higher. They are going to have to be louder. You could technically push them higher and make them get softer, but that's harder on the player. And of course, this isn't modern scoring. This is late classical, early romantic scoring. So you're assuming players that are going to be more grounded in idiomatic kinds of scoring. So idiomatically speaking, pushing trombones higher and higher, you better have them play stronger and stronger. This chorale approach ends here as the music is really building towards a fortissimo. And from this point, the players are all playing unison. You'll notice on the recording just the strength of that top trombone, that first trombone on this high A. Remember, we're in tenor clef, right? Then the second and third trombones and ophiclide down an octave plus the bassoons. So their overtones are enough to push at the fundamental of the first trombone and really make it sound spectacular. There's no need to stick the second trombone up there on that high A. But it's something that I can imagine maybe 
a hundred years ago, some of those flashy conductors who reorchestrated works, I can imagine them doing it just to get that extra edge, but it's totally not necessary. The compromise is built right into the score. And of course, Berlioz would be imagining that this was an alto trombone, right? Not a tenor, as we would see from the tenor clef that he assigned for it himself, but really an alto trombone being scored in tenor clef. On the next page, you can see everything driving towards this cadence here, ending everything mightily on G minor again. But let's see how they get there. Notice that the flutes are continuing on with their sort of demonic hell flame sort of swirling above, and they're doing it harmonized in thirds, and the harmonization is being doubled below in oboes and clarinets. We have the same driving approach in our strings with some of the notes coming from above with their grace notes in the violins and the cellos. And then the middle strings harmonizing on these F sharps in between. But there is also an F sharp in the bass, which we got from the previous bar. And at this point, Berlioz brings in baguettes of wood. In other words, wooden beaters or firm beaters. Now here, <laughs> our trombones are really going for it. And you can see why Berlioz opted to not put the second trombone up there on this high C because he really wanted that to be an alto note and it would be a bit brutal for the tenor trombone of that time to go up for that high A. I mean, it's totally possible, but it might have a kind of coarseness to the timbre for what he might be expecting. So it's much more elegant to have the alto trombone be up there covering this high passage. Of course, the tenor trombones of today and the concert trombonists are perfectly capable of playing up to C, D, sometimes even E flat, with a lot of power and clarity. Of course, don't score very many E flats without consulting your trombonist, <laughs> I would say. D is fine, but E flat is kind of pushing it. Going all the way up to C here with our alto trombone, Ophiclides lower trombones and four bassoons all playing together and this is just going to be scorching by the time we get to here. It's a poco a poco crescendo, right? So we're assuming that we're going to be getting to this massive fortissimo right in here. And let's look at that. We are driving our ophiclides all the way up to E flat, up into an area where Berlioz wanted to keep them back right? It was a good time to jump down an octave halfway through the last screen. But now he's really showing that Ophiclides can go all the way up there to this high E flat. Combining that with our lower trombones, as I said before, and our bassoons. And now looky what we got here, as the evil rednecks will say in some weird post-apocalyptic film. We have got a high E flat in our alto trombone. And that's a note that alto can easily play. They can go all the way up to F comfortably without any kind of question. And of course, some tenor trombone players can go all the way up to F. I would say if it's only a question of going a little further, and that's why you want to score alto, then just be careful, okay? Alto trombones are becoming more and more common. They're actually not that expensive to get a good one. I have a trombonist friend who's got, I think, one or two altos, and they've got uh, little triggers on them. I think it's a B-flat trigger, and that gives them a little bit more security on some of the lower pitches. Even he, who is a great alto trombone specialist, has recommended that I not score anything for him that is higher than F, which he feels is a secure note and is fine to play. So really, if it's only a question of going three semitones higher than 
a tenor trombone's top D, then I don't know if it's really worth it to risk your piece not being playable or just being turned down because it has an alto trombone part just because you wanted that high F or that high E. So just be careful if you fall in love with the alto trombone. I mean, I'm in love with it too. <laughs> I want to score some things for alto trombone more than I have already. Now that pitch is being doubled by our unison. Once again, don't use the word unison on brass and winds. If this is your first lecture, I've repeated in every lecture so far, don't use the word unison, use ah two in a situation like this, or ah four in the case of the bassoons. So our unison cornets are doubling that top line by the alto trombone. I think that's a beautiful color. And E flat horns right in here are doubling the middle line here of trombones and ophiclides and bassoons and so on. So that makes a hugely potent entrance. And notice it's fortissimo with the implication of an accent in this diminuendo. It's not intended to be fortissimo and then forte on this note. It's fortissimo pushing on the first note and then releasing slightly, but it's still going to be fortissimo by the time you get to here. And supporting this thumping that's coming in here in our left side of the stage timpani, we've got trumpets playing a two, not unison, on a D, and then our B flat basso first and second horns are playing a D seventh down below. And that is just adding to the dominant seventh harmony right here. Okay, so what is everybody else doing as we're rushing towards this cadence? We've got these wonderful triple stops completely playable because these are open D fifths, right? And so all the player has to do is just add an F sharp on top or a D on top. And one thing that's also cool here is bringing in the strings in a triple octave. And this will probably not be enormously heard against the brass, but they'll still add a sort of a sheen to it and make it more orchestral rather than band-like. So that leads us to right here. Now let's stick with the melody because that's basically almost everything going forwards for the next 12 bars or so. We've gotten all the way back to G minor, so we're going to have that high G note. G, F, bum, ba, da, dum, bum, 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 ba, da, dum. And notice that Berlioz goes back to his strategy of dying away, right? So he walks all the way down here through two octaves of melody and then walks up a little bit to C here for pianissimo, and then changing the harmony, he hits us right here with this massive C sharp, which really is D flat. But he's arriving there because he wants to think of the player as fingering C sharp rather than moving their finger over to D flat. That's the entire thing there. So he's just making it easier on the lower string players. And then that same approach is being duplicated in some, not all, parts. So here you have D going to C-sharp and so on. But here E going to E-flat, sounding D-flat. That makes more sense because of the correction that the natural horn player has to do to that pitch in order to get an E-flat, rather than correcting the D and going up to the sharp. And since he's got fully chromatic cornets with pistons here. He's going from E natural to E flat because that is just the thing. Here with the trombones and ophiclides, he may as well have just scored D flats instead of C sharps. Once we get here, we've got the melody going forwards in D flat major, and it looks like it's going to make a complete two octaves, but it doesn't quite get there. And that melody that I just went over with you is doubled in almost every instrument. Looking at the flutes here, you see them playing that high G, walking down, and then when they get down to C, Berlioz very wisely avoids having them play B flat in the staff like the oboes, but jumping up the octave to catch the overtones and then going up. 
And it doesn't really matter that you suddenly have this higher note in there because the harmony coming from these fiercely tremoloed upper strings is going to cover some of that jumping. I'll talk about the accompanying parts in a minute. Actually, I'm feeling this huge sense of momentum going forwards in this lecture right now. The nature of the music is pushing me forwards and I feel like it's helping me to lecture here. Going to the C sharp and then correcting it to D flat major and we're pushing our flutes all the way up to a high A flat, which is a perfectly playable note in any era. Here we've got our oboes, and the oboes do something kind of the opposite of the flutes. And the oboes borrow a trick from the flutes. When they get down here to this A flat, they jump up to join with the flutes and then continue on their way downwards. Tracking at the octave, here they join again and then jump down an octave. Meanwhile, <laughs> our C clarinets can run the entire length of the melody without doing any kind of compromise from the high G down two octaves to the low G, and they could have even gone further if they'd needed to. And their melodic arc is uncompromised, going all the way through. And the same thing is true an octave lower with the bassoons. They can easily go from this high G which, if they were completely unadorned and unaccompanied by everything else, would be a hellaciously massive note here on this high G. Kind of a screaming, tremulous note, with all four players playing up their fortissimo in their tenor register. But fortunately, it is doubled by everything else. So they're all playing, and they're diving down here to this G. And then same thing, C sharp, changing to D flat, walking up, and ending with this high A flat, perfectly playable by bassoons of any era. We've got a similar interesting situation in how Berlioz treats the melody in his natural and chromatic brass. Let's start with the obvious ones and get them out of the way right away so we don't have to worry about them later. Ophiclide starting off on G and then jumping up before things get too low. Barely, I was, didn't want to score a low B flat for them, at least not yet. And then walking up here and then jumping down to D flat and coming up again. Okay, so all good. We have a similar approach happening here for our third trombone and actually jumping up a little bit early so that they can play this G and the octaves change into a unison here for both the second and third trombone and then going on in unison until they change into octaves here and then harmonize. So you'll see here that most of the harmony right here at the beginning of this bar is coming from either the strings right in here or a note or two in the brass and that is enough to hear this as a big beautiful A flat major chord. Continuing on our alto trombone up there on a high G, same note as the second trombone, walking down and then correcting upwards just to keep it in that nice sweet alto register as much as possible. And then walking up but not getting too far before jumping down and coming from below again. That all works out fine. Those are all chromatic instruments and we see something similar in our chromatic cornets walking down in octaves, changing to a unison here, going back to octaves, throwing in a little harmony here, and then first cornet going on, joining in unison again, and so on, and then having a little bit of harmony here at the end, sounding E flat fourth. So now let's talk about everything that he does to include as much of his non-chromatic natural brass. Starting off here with this sounding G octave and then walking down to sounding F's then leaving off any kind of unison here on this beat changing to unison right in here and then pretty much staying unison all the way through to the end until we get a little bit of harmony. 
That's all pretty well playable on our B-flat basso horns. And it's covering some of the same pitches here as the trombones and so on. Remember, this is sounding down a major ninth, so an octave and a major second. Since the melody is essentially in two flats, or the first seven bars, then that fits in perfectly with the natural tuning, with only a couple of weird notes, like this A right in here and so on, that can be managed. Then E flat, certainly easy enough to correct on a natural horn, F and G and so on, it's all really doable. Now here we've got E flat horns, so Berlioz has to throw in the occasional F sharp, which is also doable. And this is all played in unison. It's sounding the same pitches as the bassoons to start off with. And then jumping up again, it's playing the same notes as the clarinet, walking downwards to sounding A, written F sharp, then walking up, kind of staying in the same register as the C clarinets, then hanging on this sounding D flat for a while, and then once again sticking to the unison with our clarinets, and then dropping off here and dropping down, so it's the same pitches as the bassoons. Now finally, our natural trumpets. And notice here, he is just electing to throw in harmony. So right in here, we've got sounding B flat, which adds some harmony to this right in here. And natural trumpets are just fearsomely huge. They can really sound big in a chord like this. So sounding B flat right here, this note is going to be sounding F, the same as our bassoons then throwing in a B-flat when we get to that pitch in the melody. Then another B-flat harmonizing as we have this little sighing section of the passage. Against that we have the same B-flat that is being held here by the second violins. And just hanging on that note for a while. And then coming back to a sounding C, which is the same pitch that is being played an octave higher in our first and second violins. And then going onwards, a sounding F, which gives us the median for our D flat major chord. In fact, really, if you consider this F right in here and the F being played by the timpani right in here, it really is the only median pitch being supplied at all to give us any context that this is D flat major rather than C sharp minor or whatever. Going on a little bit more of that F, hanging on the F a little bit more, and then coming back in with B flat as we're approaching this change to an A flat major chord right in here, and that gives us the C, also the median of A flat major. So you can see that the trumpets are really giving up their heroic role as leading the brass section, and they're really just filling in little bits and pieces. It's the cornets and the horns that are really doing the heroic stuff along with our trombones and especially our alto trombone. So that is how this massive confusing tutti works, but wait, there's more, and that is Everything right here in the middle, kind of interesting that all of these parts are together with the bass drum and the cymbal coming in here, tish, mezzo forte, fortissimo, mezzo forte. And here Berlioz is saying, hey, would you please well observe the difference between loud and demi fort, medium loud. So he really wants this to be big and then draw back, but still being medium loud, and so on, going back and forth. And really, those are the only dynamic changes. Everybody else is getting this nice dynamic curve right in here, downwards, and then just a big straight fortissimo passage right in here. But the cymbals and bass drum are definitely working together 
to come into the foreground texture and then get in the back and so on. And even during this massively fortissimo passage right in here with no dynamic change to all the other instruments. Meanwhile, <laughs> our timpani are playing from both sides of the stage, underlining the G minor here with a G minor third, and then going up here to this F, which is helping to underline this pitch right in here of A, right? So we've got our F and our A, and in the strings we also have an F here, and that is being played against these Fs and Cs in our middle strings. Then rolling on this G, continuing on, really kind of underlining the whole idea that this is a big melody in G minor. And then when D flat comes in, as I mentioned before, we have a roll here on the mediant. It's sort of a common wisdom amongst people who score for timpani, scoring the mediant being okay in a timpani note if it's a minor chord. But Berlioz is showing that it's okay in a major chord as well. You can roll on the major third without really damaging the harmony above. What are the strings doing right in here? They are either just kind of hanging on a G minor chord, very beautifully scored, up to here, or they are changing the harmony around a little bit in order to fit in with the progression of the melody. And I won't go over it, it's just a lot of stuff. What is really interesting is when they get to here, they all hang on this massive D flat and just continue on and don't make any compromises with the rising melody. So when the melody was descending, Berlioz compromises and tries to make things work. When the melody is ascending, he just sits on a D flat and then adds some harmony right in here. Okay, so Berlioz developed his descending melody by having it ascend in smaller groups. And then he had one big massive two octave melody again, and then turning around on D flat and going up and getting to about an octave and a half, not playing the entire melody across two octaves. Then he starts to take that apart, right? He is taking smaller bits and pieces. He's having the ascending melody here. Then he's having it drop and play other little bits of it, turning it into a motive. So where do we go from there? I will show you in the second half of the lecture. But for now, just to prep that, notice that everybody is playing these octaves together. We've got the first and the seconds walking from A flat up to E flat, and then from E flat up to A, going to the next note in the next bar. And the violas and cellos are playing in unison together, and then an octave below that, we've got the double basses. So keep that in mind, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it in the second part of this lecture. But notice that he's taking a small snapshot of his theme right in here and he is going to develop that into smaller and smaller bits, very much influenced by Beethoven, I think. So listen for all those things, the way that the theme turns around, this lovely stack of pitches and how the brass all work together in the middle, the harmonic role of the trumpets rather than thematic role, the way that the harmony comes in here in these sort of devilish musical flames licking at the artist as he marches to his doom, and then, of course, previously, this descending row of staccato and pizzicato leading to this very driving section here in the overall context of an ascending Phrygian scale over which the lower brass are playing this wonderful chorale in here. And then I will see you for the last three screens of this lecture.
At this point, Berlioz is taking smaller and smaller fragments of his melodic motion, and he's developing it in a way that will create more and more momentum going forward. Here he says, on the fourth string. So all of this is going to be played sol G in our firsts and seconds. And from this point, this becomes harmonized. B flat A, B flat, B natural C, and so on, and right in here, G, F sharp, G, D, and then contrary motion right in here, which I think is so cool, C, B flat. Those same pitches being doubled by our cellos and then an octave lower by the double basses. This really is essentially just a development of the first theme, but of course done motivically just using smaller and smaller bits of it and making it more and more about the momentum going forwards ending in these cadences every few bars. Very nicely punctuated by timpani, double bass and cymbals. Really really cool. We have a return of the laughter of the crowd right in here. A little bit more sophisticated and direct so that things can end on this cadence right in here on G minor. And I really love this dun -da -dun, dun -da -dun, dun -da -dun. doubled flutes, oboes, and clarinets all on the same G. Then in the middle, we've got our cornets doubled along with the third horn, and then an octave lower, bassoons and fourth horn. And then everybody coming together on this cadence. Bum, bum. Very, very nicely done. I'm not going to break this down because we'll be here all day, but just notice where the weight is with the winds above, the brass below that, some of it pitched higher and then some of it around the same kind of middle area as the bassoons, and then this downward diving ophoclide and timpani unison here. DG and the little shot of median harmony in there with our B-flat on the minor third. Now we're coming in again. Berlioz is going to make things even more devastating <laughs> with first flute, an octave higher, then of course the same unison between all of the other upper winds. Then our first bassoon doubling the same pitches as third and fourth horn, cornets, alto trombone, and then an octave lower than that, second and third trombone, and third and fourth bassoons, and then an octave lower than that, we've got timpani pounding away on the bottom. And it's actually really effective that there isn't anything doubling the timpani here. It allows their sound to be nice and round and open and not dragged down by say, a low bassoon or an ophoclide or anything like that. It just really has this freedom to pound away down there. And then pretty much the same cadence as before, note for note. And here the strings sort of turn into a two-bar pattern, coming back to G minor each time, reflected in the little chorale right in here in the winds. And that happens a couple times. And then Berlioz kind of condenses down the whole idea of the opening theme with a few added notes. Just walking all the way down here, not quite getting to G, but ending on a B flat so that he can throw in this D flat major right in here. Very, very fun. Notice the ophoclides going up and down. I think hearing actual ophoclide players playing this was probably what made him decide not to use ophoclides that much in the future and not to recommend them for anything more than just a really basic supporting role in music in his grand treatise. I would say probably this is the most daring scoring that he's got here in this symphony and it works way better on tuba than it does probably on ophoclide. We'll take a quick look at the harmony right in here because we've got this lovely idea of the winds and brass doing call and response with the strings and timpani, getting a little shorter each time, going back and forth and getting softer. Let's look at how this harmony is all stacked up here. D flat thirds on top with our flutes, the first oboe catching that same D flat with an F 
on the bottom, and then that same F being played by second clarinet with the fifth of the chord being filled in by the first clarinet, then D flat octave below that and the bassoons. All right, so that takes care of a very beautifully harmonized chord for the winds. As to our brass, that's also pretty simple. We got our trumpets playing the median here, sounding F in our B flat trumpets. And right here, sounding A flat on the fifth for our cornets. And then our trombones taking the root of that triad. So essentially what you're seeing here is a triad with the root, the median, and the fifth all playing a nice little D flat triad. And then an octave below, we have these D flat thirds in our lower trombones. And as I just mentioned, the ophiclide kind of going over a jaunty arpeggiation of a D flat octave chord. The horns are a little different though. Ah two sounding D flats in our third and fourth horns. So basically doubling this pitch right here in our alto trombone. Really, really nice scoring by the way. Then here we've got our first horn doubling the sounding Fs that the trumpets are playing. Remember this is sounding down a ninth, right? So this G right here is actually sounding this F space right in here. And then this G being played by the second horn is actually doubling what's going on with the second trombone. Really nicely scored wind and brass chord. This is excellent, excellent band scoring. Berlioz could have written for concert band easily. Then right in here we have the string section reacting in G minor. D flat to G minor going back and forth and Berlioz even just makes a note about it. Look, these are meant to contrast and there aren't any mistakes here. So it's just really kind of telling people don't fix my harmony. This is the way that it's meant to be. Very simple scoring right in here. B flat sixth, right? So you've got the median and the tonic above. And then filling in on the dominant, we've got our violas. And that is really, really effective scoring because the violas are playing very penetrating, very standout octaves right in there. They'll be heard very nicely. And just very simple median right in here of B flat. And then down a tenth sounding, we have our double basses. And filling in in the bass there on the same note, we've got that same G at concert pitch in our right side of the stage timpani and then the median above that B flat on our left stage timpani. So really nicely scored chords. I could probably explain all of these in an instant with just a little diagram and I may do that in the future. So things kind of get more and more feeble and then big massive five chord right in here leading us inexorably in this massive rush back towards the tonic of G minor again. This is something else that I could also break down for you but I think that your skills are getting better and better if you follow this series. You can easily see the G on top here being doubled by the flutes and the oboes taking the second violin line and so on and then that same line being played by the first clarinet and then the lower pitches right in here, this F right in here being doubled by the violas and so on. And then I really love this little contrary motion that comes in here. Very, very nice, effective and simple, possibly even brutal counterpoint, but it works really, really well. Notice that as Berlioz has these two intersecting lines going towards each other, he still underlines the root here with his lower strings and timpani. And that takes us to the very last screen for this sad movement. Our artist has made his way all the way to the block. And he's probably had his shirt stripped off and his head stuck into the guillotine. And we have some more really great harmonic scoring right in here. I love the way that the strings come in here and they just really shove up <laughs> to these D's. When we get to this five chord right in here of D major, suddenly everybody stops and the clarinet comes in here 
playing the same D, which would be the tonic of our dominant seventh chord, but it's in the context of G major. It itself is the dominant D5 of G major. We see the root right in there. And what is this but a quote of the E day fix again? So is he thinking about his love who he hallucinates having killed in a fit of jealousy? Is he thinking over his crime? Is he actually seeing her in the crowd? Who knows? In some whimsical fantasy. But we have that same little bum, 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 bum. And this is the only overt appearance of the Ide fix. Perhaps the Ide fix is somehow hidden in the fabric of this movement in previous places. And I will leave that up to our musical detectives. But right in here, this is the only mention in this movement. And it's a fitting one, I think. And this is probably something that was inserted by Berlioz when he adapted this movement from his opera. And then, of course, it ends with a big kahwam, which I'm not going to break down for you. You can break that down for yourself. But very simple, very effective, direct G minor chord. And that is the last moment of our artist's life, because his head tumbles into the basket, as you can see by these little gruesome downward pizzicatos right in here. Berlioz does not want this pizzicato to be buried by any kind of wash coming from our cymbals and double bass. He wants it to be really, really brief. So they're going to just go boom and just stop it. He says, muffle the sound with your hand. And in the case of the cymbal player, they would muffle the cymbals by just holding them against their chest after they had clashed them together right here. And I would probably imagine that the timpani player would do the same thing, seeing this rest and observing the directions from the other percussionists. They would just put their hands on the tops of the kettles to stop their resonance. And probably, even as a conductor, I would be telling everybody in the orchestra to play this as an eighth note rather than as a quarter note. Not to make it staccato in a springy way, but just to make it short and direct. That is followed by a big roll here. Previously, I forgot to point it out, Berlioz had told the first timpani player to retune the B flat to a B natural. And here we can see why he wants a big rolled G major chord. And you know, I just, once again, I feel like I have to remind you guys that this kind of harmonic scoring in timpani doesn't really exactly work the way you think it is going to. You can see here that the demands on the percussion section are such that it really calls for six individual players. One person each on each of these single line percussion instruments. And if you really want to get that beautiful tight roll on each one of these kettles, then it really has to be a separate person playing each one. Usually timpani players don't do that. You'll have one timpanist playing two kettles at the same time, either beating back and forth between the two, which actually makes the incidence of each stroke half as fast as it would if both beaters were on the same kettle. And there's other ways of getting around that and making it go faster and so on, which I won't get into right now, but there are probably going to have to be five players here, I think. So one cymbal player, one bass drum player, one player on the snares, and then at least two for the timpani. Now, what is the purpose of this big drum roll? I have heard tell, this is probably the most gruesome orchestration anecdote that I'm ever going to share, but you know, who cares really? We're kind of heading into Halloween territory at this point with more than slightly morbid observations aplenty. And one thing I read long ago was that there was a drum roll after a decapitation because that was supposed to have been heard by whatever consciousness was left in the head of the body after it was cut off. Of course, how could the person who wrote that know that that was actually so, right? Nobody ever had their head cut off and then put back on and then came back to talk about, oh boy, the drum roll there at the end of my guillotining was so interesting and that really helped me into the afterlife. 
So that's dubious at best. But one thing I do know, to keep it gruesome, apologies, is that sometimes when a horrible criminal had had their head cut off, the head would be held up by the executioner to show the crowd, and possibly even their name might be cried out by somebody there, you know. Here's the head of the evil Hector Berlioz who killed the love of his life. One last little analysis of the harmony here, and pretty much it stays consistent all the way through. So let's just pick it up from right here, being mindful of the fact that it's the same thing going before. Fifth in the oboes, which alternate above. As the violins come in here, notice that these triple stops here are marked as half notes, which means really that the top part is going to be the half note and the D below is going to be let go of almost immediately. And the same thing is true here. Notice that it's climbing each time even though our upper winds right in here are staying the same in that lovely little G major octave chord that they've got going between them. But they're rising each time. We have the open D with a D sixth above. Actually here we've got a G fifth built under a D sixth, and then a D octave with that same D sixth, and that stays there. Here we've got a triple octave here, very easy to play, ending with a G octave and that same exact harmony as before. And then the harmony here in the rest of the strings is really simple, just open G fifths in our basses, and this could also be played as a nice rich open note on the first string of our double basses and ending here with some easily playable harmonies. We've got a G major third here in the viola is also very, very easy to play. And this is also open G and D with a B on top. Well, the real juicy stuff I know is the brass and the rest of the wind. So going back into here, really simple alternation between B and a B6, G third, B6, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of following along with what's going on in the strings. The third and fourth bassoons are just playing G octaves, really simple, and the first and second are just alternating between B naturals and Ds, and then just ending on a D, and then going all the way up to G here. And this is quite interesting right in here that both of our horn parts are written E octaves, but since these are basso B flat horns, that is actually D an octave lower. So essentially the same D that is being played at the top of this double stop here in the cellos. Whereas the E flat horns are playing G octaves. So pretty simple right in there. The trumpets right in here are playing this E sounding D. It is going to be the same note that is being played by the first horn. These are sounding G thirds, a whole step down from where they're scored. Right here, we've got these lovely Gs being played by our alto trombone, and those are the same Gs as are being played by the third horn right here. B thirds by the other trombones, and then these Gs here are being doubled by the fourth horn. And then below, we just have the ophicleide going up and down on octaves, right? So it's beautiful, rich band scoring once again. The strings are adding a little bit of color in here to make it more justifiable as an orchestral piece. But let me tell you that on this final stroke, it is rare to hear an orchestral recording or performance where the strings really add a whole lot. It is just going to be about the brass right here because it is so rich and so penetrating and so massive that that's really what you're going to hear, is the brass writing here. And, and it's fine. This is their moment, and that's where they're going to shine, and everybody else in the orchestra is just going to help out a little bit. So that is the consequence of that kind of scoring. Unless, of course, you're in a studio and you can adjust the volume controls and so on and so forth, which is kind of cheating by my way of thinking for a concert work. So that is the fourth movement of Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique. Now going forward, 
we are going to see the aftermath of this drug-induced fantasy that he's having about his own execution, where, at his own funeral, there's a black mass being held, <laughs> and I don't know if it's the spirit of his departed beloved or a demonic representation of her or something like that, but she comes to mock him, and the Ide fix will show up a couple more times. Listen for that beautiful band scoring, this wonderful rolled G major triad right in here in our timpani, the really gruesome way that the Ide fix is brought to an abrupt halt here, and the sound of the head hitting the basket. And then, of course, just rushing towards that with all of these other elements. Not to mention what comes before, a D-flat harmony in the winds and brass alternating with G minor being pounded away at in strings and timpani, and then weakening as we get towards here and coming in on this blazing five chord. And then, of course, before that, all of Berlioz's lovely little developments of his motive which is sort of boiled down from little bits and pieces of the main theme. That one last little laughter from the crowd as our hero is dragged from his cart up the steps to the guillotine. And these really great octaves right in here. Berlioz scores octaves so wonderfully. And, of course, coming back in with this little cadence. Five, one, just done so well along with these very jolting dotted rhythms below in the strings. So enjoy all of that. I hope that you got a lot out of this lecture, and then we will pick it up with the Song of the Night, the Black Mass over Berlioz's own funeral. It's almost like writing your own obituary. And Berlioz really delivers on that. I can't wait to share it with you, and it should be coming up pretty quickly here on Patreon and in fairly short order on its regular release in YouTube a couple months later. Thanks everybody. I really enjoyed this movement. So thanks very much to everybody for supporting this and viewing it. And I have gone into extra detail on this movement just because I'm aware that it is one of the most played classical pieces on its own just as a movement taken out of a symphony. And so anybody who wants to study it really deserves a thorough explanation, and I hope that you got it. See everybody again soon.